That's related to whales. Most of you, I think, are familiar with the uh, arguments between evolution and uh, creationism. And intelligent design, of course, uh, uh, merits a part of that. Uh, the question that uh, we're going to be looking at in particular has to do with whether you can detect design in nature. And remember that evolution, the, the, the fundamental meaning of what I'm going to be calling evolution here is not just that creatures have evolved, have changed between one thing and another, but that they've changed by a particular mechanism that does not require any intelligence. Random variations which have no meaning behind them and natural selection, the natural process of whether they fit into a particular environment or not. And uh, that is contrast with uh, planned relationships between an organism and its environment. And the difficulty can be uh, great trying to make sense of it all. Um, don't forget, evolution, one of its major reasons for being is that it provides an explanation for the appearance of design that does not require a designer. As, um, as uh, Richard Dawkins stated, the problem very succinctly, biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And of course, the blind watchmaker is all about how Dawkins feels that evolution can explain this without having to have recourse to a designer or a purpose. Um, now, arguments against design uh, sometimes, uh, well, they fall into several categories. One of them is, uh, must be an evil designer because there's evil in the world. Uh, another one is, that is also used, is why wouldn't an intelligent designer reuse the same design? If we create light switches and we use them in houses and they work reasonably well, we would commonly use them, let's say, in the bathroom of, a, of an airplane. Uh, because uh, once you have a reliably stable design, you tend to repeat it everywhere. And uh, um, why would you use a little di different uh, design for this particular organism and then one for that organism that's uh, different always a little different, and sometimes quite a bit different. Um, and then the other question that's asked commonly is why would design produce a nested hierarchy, um, whereas that is the expected uh, result of an evolutionary pathway to where you can tell these organisms are more closely related than those organisms, and, and uh, that's pretty universal in all of their functions. Now, an argument against evolution can be made as to say, how do you evolve the same mechanism twice? Um, bird wings, bat wings come up. Uh, uh, there are some uh, walking stick inde insects that uh, apparently, if you believe the standard story, have evolved wings 42 separate times. And that starts to stretch the imagination. And the other question that can be asked is, biology really a nested hierarchy? And uh, those are questions that I want you to kind of keep in mind as we go through this. Uh, convergent evolution is kind of an interesting question. All of a sudden, you have different organisms that have the same basic structures, it's always been assumed that they are different in their, um, in their genetics, even though the, uh, the structures look very similar. And then, of course, we have now found similar genetics in different, widely different organisms, and the general hypothesis for that is lateral gene transfer. Um, one thing I'll point out is that shall we call it assisted lateral gene transfer, is presumably indistinguishable 
from unassisted lateral gene transfer. Um, and possibly easier to do if you have an assistant. This morning we're going to talk about bats and whales and uh, what they have to do with the subject at hand. And uh, for that we're going to go to Science Daily and if you're interested in the uh, reference it'll be there and <coughs> if you can't take it down right now it will be posted uh, later today uh, on the internet. And uh, the title of, the, of their uh, little paper is In Bats and Whales, Convergence and Echolocation Ability Runs Deep. Um, only some bats and toothed whales rely on sophisticated echolocation in which they emit sonar pulses and process returning echoes to detect and track down small prey. Now, two new studies in January 26th, 26th issue of Current Biology, a cell press publication, shows that bats and whales' remarkable ability in the high frequency hearing it depends on are shared at a much deeper level than anyone would have anticipated, all the way down to the molecular level. The discovery represents an unprecedented example of adaptive sequence convergence between two highly divergent groups and suggests that such convergence at the sequence level might be more common than scientists had suspected. Presumably they weren't looking for it before. The natural world is full of examples of species that have evolved similar characteristics independently, such as the tusks of elephants and walruses, said Stephen Rossiter of the University of London, an author of one of the studies. However, it is generally assumed that most of these so-called convergent traits have arisen by different genes or different mutations. Our study shows that a complex trait, echolocation, has in fact evolved by identical genetic changes in bats and dolphins. A hearing gene known as Preston in both bats and dolphins has picked up many of the same mutations over time, the study shows. As a result, if you draw a phylogenetic tree of bats, whales, and a few other mammals based on similarities in the Preston sequence alone, the echolocating bats and whales come out together rather than with their rightful evolutionary cousins. Both research teams also have evidence showing that those changes to Preston were selected for, suggesting that they must be critical for the animal's echolocation for reasons the researchers don't yet fully understand. The results imply that there are very limited ways, if not only one way, for a mammal to hear high frequency sounds, said uh, Zhenzi Zhang of the University of Michigan, who led the other study. The sequence conversion occurred because of the amino acid changes in Preston that result in high frequency selection and sensitivity were strongly favored in echolocating mammals and because there are, and they inserted apparently, very limited ways in which Preston can acquire this ability. Preston is found in the outer hair cells that serve as an amplifier in the inner ear, refining the sensitivity and frequency selectivity of the mechanical vibrations of the cochlea, Zhang explained. Rossiter's team, including Xu Zhang of East China Normal University, showed previously that the Preston gene has undergone sequence convergence among unrelated line lineages of echolocating bats. Now, so what that says is that these bats were not considered to be related to each other that closely, but somehow they had developed, in other words, this isn't the first time we've seen this kind of convergence. There was already convergence among unrelated, apparently, bats, but now we're talking bats and dolphins. These authors, along with Zhang's team at Maya, Michigan, now show that convergence extends to echolocating dolphins. And then they quote Rossiter, we were surprised by the strength of support for the conversion, convergence between these two groups of mammals and related to this by the sheer number of convergent changes in the coding DNA that we found. We were especially excited 
to discover that these changes were likely to be adaptive and also that non-echolocating whales do not group with the bats but instead remain with their true relatives, the even-toed ungulates. Although they rely on a similar ability, in fact, bats and whales vary greatly in echolocation. Michigan's Zhang pointed out, for example, bats use echolocation for the ranges for ranges up to three meters, whereas whales use for ranges up to greater than 100 meters. And more importantly, the speed of sound in air is about one-fifth of that in water, making the information transfer during sonar transmission much slower for bats than for whales. Despite these gross differences, our findings suggest that the high-frequency acoustic sensitivities and selectivities of bats and whales echolocation appear to rely on a common molecular design of Preston. Now, in the same uh, our, uh, same journal, same issue as these two uh, papers that came out, there's another editorial that's worth looking at, which is just absolutely fascinating. It's called Molecular Evolution, Gene Convergence in Echolocating Mammals. It's written by Gareth Jones, and it's in Current Biology. Uh, and uh, it's available on the web. And it, this, this is the uh, ab abstract. The motor protein Preston converts sensitive and selective hearing in mammals. Remarkably, Preston amino acid sequences of echolocating dolphins have converged to res resemble those of distantly relating echolocating bats. Appearances can deceive. That's how it starts out. Biologists are very familiar with example, examples of morphologic characters that converge independently in response to similar selective pressures, resulting, from, resulting in the evolution of organisms that are very alike in appearance despite having different ancestry. Such convergent evolution can then confound the reconstruction of evolutionary history. Here's an example. The hedgehog Henrix of Madagascar were long believed to be close relatives of what they called true hedgehogs and were placed alongside of them in the mammalian order Insectivora because of their extensive morphological similarities, including the possession of spines. Recent and extensive gene sequencing studies have produced a stable tree topology for the higher level phylogeny of placental mammals and the tenrics are now placed in a clade of mammals that diversified in Africa, the superordinal clade Afrotheria, which is phylogenetically distinct from the clade that diversified in the northern supercontinent Laurasia, which includes and includes true hedgehogs, or the Laurasia theria. So they used to say, same animal, just they're a very closely related animal because they look exactly alike. And now they've done sequencing and no, they're not exactly alike. Presumably, uh, genetics trumps uh, morphology. Phylogenies based on gene sequences are often considered as being less susceptible to homoplasy, that is, the possession of similarities that evolved independently in different lineages and fake you out, you think they're homologous and they're really, they're fake homologs. That are trees, then are trees based on morphology. So the genetics are supposed to be more reliable and therefore have the potential to determine the evolutionary relationships in a more robust and reliable manner. Convergence of gene and amino acid sequences is traditionally considered to be rare in this issue of Current Biology, convergent research by Lee et al. and Liu et al. Interestingly enough, Lee's first name is Ying, and Liu's first name is Yang. So these are the Ying and Yang papers, but I am not making this up. Uh, gives a stunning insight into how gene and protein sequences can be subject to convergent ab adaptive evolution in similar ways to morphological characters. Their studies are based on Preston, a motor protein found in the outer hair cells of the inner ear of the mammalian cochlea. 
The expression of Preston correlates with the appearance of outer hair electromotility, and Preston differs from classical motors that are driven by enzymes that require ATP hydrolysis by converting voltage to force directly. Consequently, Preston acts several orders of magnitude more quickly than cellular motor proteins, and its contribution to auditory sensitivity in mammal, mammals is immense, that is. A targeted deletion of Preston showed a greater than 100-fold, or that's 40 decibels, loss of auditory sensitivity in mice. You don't have the gene, the mice can't hear. A sensory system that places extreme demands on audition is echolocation. Echolocation involves producing sound, typically ultrasound of greater than 20 kilohertz, and then receiving and analyzing echoes that return from objects. Echolocation has attained its greatest sophistication in bats and tooth whales, such as dolphins and porpoises, where it is used for orientation and often to detect, localize, and classify prey. Echolocating animals are complex phenotypically and show many adaptive special specializations associated with sound production and hearing. Preston is unique to mammals and its evolution resulted from positive selection acting on orthologs. Saw you carry your anion transport family proteins since mammals split from a common ancestor with birds. Interestingly, there are echolocating birds. Apparently, they don't use Preston. Preston was believed to be under strong purifying selection and hence became conserved in mammals. But recent evidence shows it to have undergone further positive selection in bat species that use specialized constant frequency echolocation, that is CF bats, and which have associated sharp tuning in their auditory systems. Moreover, bats, bats that produce echolocation calls in the larynx, laryngeal echolocators, form a monophyletic group in a phylogenetic tree based on Preston gene sequences. Now remember that these bats are not all supposed to be actually related to each other. They, if, it's just if you take Preston, they look like they're related to each other. This result conflicts with recent construction of the evolutionary history of bats based on large-scale genetic analysis of both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. So. It depends on which gene you use, which tree you get. Which show that laryngeal echolocators are paraphyletic. That means that um, the echolocation is not restricted to one family. With one clade, including non echolocating fruit bats, such as a sister group to CF bats, using sophisticated laryngeal echolocation. The other clade, including all, in all other bats that use laryngeal echolocation. So the fruit bats belong in one group that's more closely related to the CF bats. All bats that use Laryngeal echolocation seemingly evolved similarities in Preston because of convergent evolution at amino acid sites of functional importance for echolocation, and hence phylogenetic signals based on functional gene sequences may be misleading when re reconstructing the evolutionary history of bats. Think about that last clause. Phylogenetic signals based on functional gene sequences may be misleading when reconstructing the evolutionary history of bats. How many genes are non-functional? The implications of what has just been said is that gene sequences may be misleading, period. Even more remarkable is the new finding that echolocating dolphins and porpoises show Preston gene sequences that resemble those of echolocating bats. So now if you create the tree, genes, uh, porpoises and bats belong together. Whales and dolphins belong to the order 
Sit ardiodactyla, and their closest living relatives may be hippopotamuses. Nevertheless, dolphins and porpoises share at least 14 derived amino acid sites in Preston with echolocating bats, including 10 shared with the highly specialized CF bats. Consequently, dolphins and porpoises form a sister group to CF bats in a phylogenetic analysis of Preston sequences. This finding is arguably one of the best examples of convergent molecular evolution discovered to date and is exceptional because it is likely to be adaptive driven by positive selection. So you get convergence not just of the form but also the genetics. And here's the figure one that he was referring to. Notice that old world fruit bats, horseshoe bats and other bats, this is the standard way of course where they're related closely to each other and uh, dolphins and porpoises are related to baleen whales. Well, it kind of makes sense. That's the way you'd think. But this is the way Preston would put it. You have horseshoe bats and dolphins and porpoises that are most, more closely related to other bats that use echolocation and less related to old world fruit bats that use their eyes and then, uh, or use mainly their eyes, and then baleen whales are on the outside. That is to say, dolphins and porpoises are more closely related to horseshoe bats than they are to baleen whales by a good bit, if you believe the sequences. Although it appears highly likely that adaptive forces associated with echolocation are driving the molecular evolution of Preston, what might these selective pressures be? One driver might be the necessity to hear very high frequencies. Most bats that emit constant frequency echolocation calls call at high frequencies, as do porpoises and dolphins. Interestingly, sperm whales emit lower frequencies for echolocation, and they group with the non-echolocating baleen whales in phylogenetic analysis of Preston sequences. However, mice emit and hear ultrasound of relatively high frequencies for communication, and yet their Preston is unspecialized among the an mammals. So it's not simply true that every single animal that has that kind of hearing uses that sequence. More broadly, the Preston studies are alerting evolutionary biologists to the issue that genetic data may be susceptible to homoplasy. That is to say, the genetic data may not be as reliable as they thought in proving ancestry. Evidence for m convergent molecular evolution is attracting more attention. Phylogenies based on nucleotide sequences may produce different outcomes according to whether they are based on sites that affect amino acid substitutions to a large extent or not. Although phylogeneticists have long used mitochondria gene studies to infer evolutionary relationships, recent studies on reptiles have produced unexpected findings. Agamid lizards appear as a sister taxon to snakes in phylogenetic analysis of an 11 kilobase data set of 13 protein coding mitochondrial genes. Such an arrangement conflicts with trees based on nuclear genes and morphology. And it is likely that molecular evolution in mitochondria may be susceptible to convergence, at least in reptiles. Well, it's either that or lateral gene transfer of mitochondria. Indeed, almost 40% of the convergent changes in amino acids and mitochondrial protein coding genes shared between snakes and agamid lizards may have been driven by metabolic adaptation. A key question is whether convergent adaptive evolution dominates phylogenetic signals or whether neutral evolution overrides any convergence driven by natural selection when making phylogenetic inferences. In reptile mitochondrial genes, although molecular convergence is clearly apparent, the specific selective forces driving such convergence are not obvious, may not exist. The Preston studies identify a probable selective pressure, the evolution of ultrasonic echolocation, 
Although keep in mind that I, mice do the same thing and they don't seem to need it. In driving molecular convergence, and emphasizes the necessity of avoiding the use of putative functional genes in estimating evolutionary history. And again, look at that last clause, emphasizes the necessity of avoiding the use of putative functional genes in estimating evolutionary history. And again, I will ask, how many genes are non-functional? And what does that do to the whole attempt to create the tree that way? The incorporation of a wide range of genes in phylogenetic analysis will hopefully reduce problems associated with molecular convergence, as convergence in multiple traits may be unlikely, and as more and more neutral sites are incorporated in data sets. Phylogenomic approaches will go some way to circumventing the problems arising from molecular convergence, as well careful selection of genetic data that are probably neutral, intron sequences, for example. Of course, uh, some introns have their own function, too. Even if cases of convergent molecular evolution caused by selection prove to be uncommon, the Preston example emphasizes the power of natural selection in driving evolution, even at the molecular level and in complex phenotypes that are associated with specialized behaviors. Now, just a few little pieces on that, uh, of those two papers. This is the Ying paper. Um, and uh, again, it's in current biology. It's not available on the web, although you can get it uh, from Loma Linda University <coughs> Library. Um, and here's their, I'm not going to read the whole thing, obviously. Um, but uh, here's their genetic tree. There's some interesting things in this tree, one of which, just uh, for fun, is that uh, we now know why guinea pigs are used in experiments that are supposed to be related to humans because guinea pigs are humans' closest relatives and are not related particularly to rabbits, gerbils, rats, and mice. Uh, <coughs> I don't think that's quite the... Uh, implication they wanted to draw from that, but, uh, um, but here's interesting. The, the bottlenose dolphin is stuck with these, these bats here. Uh, these bats are outside of the bottlenose dolphin, uh, and notice that the uh, probability is like 96, 98, 89, 98, depending on which particular method you're using for, uh, for determining the clades. And uh, uh, you will notice that this particular bat uh, is matched with these ones, whereas the traditional way of putting things, of course, they haven't messed with the mouse and the human. They've conveniently collect, uh, collapsed all of those. But the bottlenose dolphin is supposed to be related to the cow and less closely related to the pig, and then, of course, all the bats are supposed to be related to each other. Uh, but you can see that uh, there's quite a spread, and the bottlenose dolphin seems to be nicely put with all the other, uh, all the other echolocating uh, uh, mammals. And uh, just a particularly interesting paragraph that they had, and we'll have one more at the end, uh, what could have caused the misplacement of dolphin to the bat clade in the Preston tree? Horizontal gene transfer, gene contamination, gene pyrology, long branch attraction, and biased amino acid frequencies are all unlikely. And they give the references for that. The only remaining reason is the convergence of the Preston sequences of echolocating bats and whales, likely resulting from a common selection for amino acid altering mutations that are beneficial to echolocation. Indeed, the same misplacement of dolphin is observed in the Preston tree, reconstructed with only non-synonymous nucleotide substitutions. But when only synonymous substitutions are used, dolphin and cow are correctly grouped with 100% bootstrap support. So notice how they, how they uh, get to convergence. 
They've eliminated horizontal gene transfer. Well, that's probably a safe bet between bats and uh, whales. Uh, DNA contamination, gene pyrology, lung branch attraction, biased amino acid frequency. So they go through and eliminate everything else, and then that leaves you with convergence. Now, there's one process, of course, that's been omitted from that list. And we'll come back to that. And then the Yang paper, Liu et al., which is, uh, and here's the, uh, uh, here's their particular thing. And here you can have the, the dog and the cat and the human are, the human is used as the out group. And now the rat, mouse, mouse gerbil, and rabbit. And interestingly enough, they didn't do the guinea pig for some reason, which presumably would have matched with humans over here. Um, and the pig and the horse, which are supposed to be uh, uh, hoofed mammals. And then now notice that the, uh, the whales and the cows are supposed to be here. And sure enough, the baleen whales seem to be in that general region. And theoretically, the dolphins and the sperm whales should be there. But their dolphins are all up in here and uh, matched with bats again. So you have two different the laboratories, presumably you have two different studies. That's a pretty good confirmation of, uh, of the, the data itself. And their final comment is, regardless, our findings of adaptive sequence convergence between two highly divergent groups that share a complex phenotype is unprecedented and suggests sequence conversion may be more common than previously suspected. Uh, we're just getting started on this, and maybe this happens more often than we think. So maybe those light switches that work at home are being used in the airplane after all. Several questions I have. How common is convergent molecular evolution? And uh, is it common enough to start thinking about common uh, design rather than common ancestry? Are phylogenetic trees reliable? You have two trees that look perfectly good, except that they disagree with each other. Just depends on the, uh, on the uh, uh, sequence you happen to be using. What about the whale ear structure? Do you remember that the earliest whales were walking right? And you couldn't tell there were whales except they're in the middle air. Why are we paying so much attention to the middle air? Do we know that's a key factor? Maybe a lot of these evolutionary trees are not what they're cracked up to be. Is it all a matter of interpretation? I hope not, but it's beginning to sound a little bit that way. And if diagnosing convergent evolution is a matter of elimination, then what about common design? Have we eliminated that? Remember? The only remaining reason is the convergence of the Preston sequences of echolocating bats and whales. The only remaining reason? Or is it really the only remaining reason? Have we eliminated common design? Have we even tried? Or is that something you can just toss out at the beginning without even considering it? Some questions to think about. And now we will open the uh, floor to comments and questions. I'll just pass that back whenever. Uh, well, Go ahead, Ariel. I, I want to raise a, a question that doesn't seem to have been addressed here. Uh, and I, I fully agree with your question at the end there. Uh, and that is, what are they analyzing an evolutionary process here? What good is it going to be to make all the Preston you want if you don't have a complex system to analyze the sounds and determine how far away things are 
which is the, the key of echolocation. Uh, it's a little well, bit ha like having a fancy ultrasonic transducer, I mean, they're but just no computer to figure out what the ultrasound is exactly. supposed to look like. Exactly. They're just looking at one teeny little point here in this whole question of evolving uh, sonar uh, detection. But they and have no clue what the computer, uh, how the computer works. Well, I, sure, but it's got to be there or the thing's not going to work. That's true. Uh, which tells you, know, this is, uh, I mean, uh, you can just smile at this a little bit and say, well, come on, you guys, start asking some real questions here. Well, I think the reason they're not asking it is because they're, they're not equipped to even start to answering it. And so for them, the brain that figures out that this echo comes from this insect and not from a tree branch or, or a hawk, it's just completely foreign to them. And to try to ask the question of how that echo corresponds to the echo that the dolphin sees that is a shark and not a uh, mackerel or, uh, or a piece of floating wood. Uh, you know, those are kinds of questions that we're, none of us, I don't think, are even close to figuring out. I'm concerned about the two hedgehogs you mentioned. Um, they look alike, you said. Uh, they were thought to be alike at thought one time. Thought to be alike until they got into the genetics of it. I felt that way about Dennis for, for some time. <laughs> um, we both have beards and things, but he's different. Now, could he have develop different genes because he lived in the south when he was born? Or how did the, how did the hedgehogs get a different genetic makeup? It's a good question. I don't think we have a, a really good answer for it. Now, the interesting thing of it is, if it's a designer, the designer designed two different kinds of animals that uh, looked alike, but are otherwise um, uh, but the genetics are different. Of course, the problem with the designer introducing designer is then you have no clue as to why things should be similar. Um, and I think that's one of the things that would discourage somebody who is considering design as an answer is that then where do you go from there? Um, but then maybe all questions aren't able to be answered. Um, you know, the secret things may still belong to the Lord our God. Yeah, there's a passage in Great Controversy that suggests that most things will remain mysterious to us earthlings, at least in our present form. So maybe we strain a bit trying to find answers to these things. Maybe you should just love your hedgehog, whether he be English or foreign. <laughs> Go ahead. And Dennis remains a mystery. I can remember many years back when Marsh was talking about the, the uh, original Genesis created kinds and referring to them as baramans. And there then ensued a significant discussion about what might have been included in a baraman. I guess you've complicated matters very considerably because. Now the question can be asked, is a baraman composed of animals that are similar because they look alike? Or would it be composed of animals that are similar because they're genetically alike? My instinctive answer would be to opt for the genetics. But <laughs> as you can see, there's, there's some difficulties with that. But if it's animals that look alike, both hedgehogs would have gotten into the same baraman. Presumably both hedgehogs got into the same ark. <laughs> 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 that would 
That's an uh, even more interesting question. <laughs> I'm not sure that you can separate, uh, uh, at least that there would be complete isolation between genetic makeup and morphological makeup, because morphology is produced by the genetics. There's bound to be similarities there. Uh, so you, uh, the two aren't completely isolated in, in their action there. I, I would have to agree with that. Can you pass the mic up to Sean? Oh. Yeah, one question just sure. quickly. How many amino acids are involved in this uh, precedent situation? Uh, uh, something of the nature of 400 or so. Um, there are, you know, when they're talking about 10 and 16 that are particularly similar in these two groups that are not similar to the rest of the, of the, uh, uh, of the Preston molecules from various an animals have been uh, analyzed. So it's a relatively small number, but it's, it's a significant number. And I, I, I think it does have functional significance. That much, I, that much I think is fairly safe to say. You know, the interesting question is if you're trying to save, of course, dolphins are easy because they can live outside the, the ark. But, uh, but bats presumably would have some difficulty flying for, uh, for a year without some kind of support. So. There we go, dueling mics here. <laughs> go ahead. As far as Berrimans go, I would say it has to be genetics, regardless of how similar the creatures look or dissimilar. Um, because if you're looking statistical odds as far as a, an argument for design, as far as the limits of evolutionary progress, because we have to admit that uh, um, functionality, that natural selection works and can modify things to a certain degree. Um, so it's well easily likely that uh, Preston could be modified by natural selection in similar ways and different creatures that use it in similar ways. Uh, especially on the level of complexity that you're talking about. Three or four hundred amino acids uh, for a protein system can be modified statistically without a problem. Um, however, when you're talking about systems that get o go over several hundred, at least certainly it doesn't happen beyond a thousand, then you start, start talking about things that are beyond what we know that natural selection can do statistically. And then you're only left with design at that point. You don't have to figure out why did the designer do it this way versus that way. You don't have to know the mind of the designer to know that it was designed. Uh, at least a really good statistical argument along those lines. So uh, it, it really comes down to statistics for me anyway as, as far as determining barriments. And um, of course that's very difficult to determine when you start talking about very high level complexity machines that we just don't know enough about to divide barriments based on those machines. But we, we can do it pretty well based on things we know more about, like single protein or multiple protein systems and things like that. Then we can divide barriments, I think, pretty well. One of the uh, things that I'll observe at this point is that uh, I put a question to um, Alan McNeil once. Uh, he's uh, NMA that it teaches with, uh, or taught, I'm not sure the provine is still around. He, from what I heard, he was ill. Um, he may be deceased now, but um, uh, he taught with uh, provine, I believe it was Cornell. And, uh, and the question that I raised was this, supposing that we have now created a blue rose. And in order to do that, one of the things we had to do was to steal a blue pigment from another uh, flower and just flat out genetically transplant it into the rose. And then we had to do a few more adjustments so that it would come out in the right tissue and uh, be concentrated enough and so forth. But, um, but we've, we've been able to create that. Now, Supposing that somebody has a garden out in Madagascar somewhere, 
people leave Madagascar, or perhaps maybe even a more deserted island, the Kayones, all by himself. And nuclear war were to wipe out human population. And, uh, and so the, this particular population of roses manages to get onto the mainland and spread along with the rest of the roses. And, uh, and then some biologists from some planet of another solar system somewhere come by and start studying the Earth and find this sequence in the rose that's exactly the same as, uh, what is it, petunia or whatever, and, and says, how did that sequence get there? Well, if you eliminate designers, then of course, the, I guess the logical thing to say is it had to be lateral gene transfer or horizontal gene transfer, or whatever you want to call that. Whereas in fact, it was, if you want to call it assisted lateral gene transfer. Uh, and how would you tell the difference between the two? Uh, we now have genes for human insulin in yeast. They work very well. They keep people alive, among other things. And uh, in fact, one of the things that I would say is probably true of human lateral gene transfer is that it tends to be done for the benefit of something other than the uh, creature in which it is put. So could it be that when we see symbiosis of a high degree, that maybe we're looking at actual lateral gene transfer evidence for assisted lateral gene transfer with the intention of making a organism not just for its own benefit, but partly for another organism's benefit. Plants were made for animals to eat them, among other things. Go ahead. Um, this is very interesting, and I'm uh, trying to understand it from a layman's perspective. And you seem to be saying that traditionally evolutionary uh, relationship was based and understood primarily on physical similarities and characteristics. Historically, that was the case. We didn't have genes back. 50, 100 years ago. So people looked at things and said, this is the way they look. But now with the passage of time, there's this look at the genetic level, uh, which many people think, in fact, shows a very strong connections between various groups. But now we're basing our views of relationship on genetic structuring. And this is leading to some unusual results, like seeing some kinds of uh, whales uh, cl closer relatives to bats than they are to other whales. Which doesn't make intuitive sense. Which doesn't make intuitive sense. And um, it seems to create, as I'm trying to think it through, a larger problem um, for those that believe in clade or cladistics than those who believe in baromans because if you believe in the Behrman with created orders, what you've got is you've got a design, um, creatures which seem similar on the outside, but for whatever reason, the designer has used some unusual genes from other groups further away. Whereas if you believe in cladistics, you've got to believe that somehow these disparate relationships with, with uh, genes being closer and physical characteristics appearing to be further away, you've somehow got to draw lines between these groups and explain, in fact, how a whale turned into a bat or vice versa, or there was a common ancestor that explains both the genetic sequence, which seems similar, and, but also the, the physical characteristics, which are vastly dissimilar. And yet that's the job you have to do. You have to show, in fact, how 
these things are connected ancestrally and could have come about over long periods of time with small changes. And so this complicating factor seems to create an even larger and much more difficult problem if in fact you have the burden of showing historical ancestry. Is this, is that right? Am I? It's pretty close actually. Um, I think that uh, that nobody that I know of anyway is proposing that there was some kind of proto uh, super uh, Preston uh, sequence that somehow made it intact all the way through the bats and then and then the uh, and the toothed whales and then was discarded whenever it wasn't needed like in the baleen whales or even the sperm whale which uses a lower level. Uh, if you try to do that, then you have to ask, well, why didn't the mouse get the same thing? Because they, they use ultrasound, too. Well, another uh, issue, too, is all these things are based on similarities. Similarities in sequence and function. Similarities are, are a lot easier to explain using, uh, using evolutionary mechanisms, so random mutation, natural selection. However, when you start talking about functional differences, those are much harder to explain using random mutation natural selection where these differences are required for certain types of functions to exist. Those are much harder to explain when you go beyond very low levels of functional complexity. When you start going beyond a few hundred amino acids to over a thousand, that's statistically impossible to explain. So a lot of evolutionists, a lot of journals are based on studying similarities and, and very little is done on studying differences. Uh, Perhaps the, one function. of the more interesting things that hasn't been brought up here is the, the orphan genes, where there are genes that have sequences that create proteins in the human, for example, that don't exist in the chimpanzee. Just not there. There's some either and really startling. There's a paper out recently that had genetic sequences that are very similar between humans and sea anemones. You know, vastly different, but the genetic sequence is almost identical between the two. And so you're like, well, what does that mean? These are identical s sequences and, and form and maybe even function. But what does that mean, these similarities? What you really have to look on is that minimum required differences to achieve uh, different types of functionality. And it's something that Dr. Roth said, um, th that usually there's got to be some meaningful connection between the genotype and the phenotype. Uh, and yet your presentation here almost seems to disconnect the two. Not entirely, but it makes them much more independent than I would have previously thought. And it makes you wonder how in fact natural selection works. If the g phenotype is sort of only loosely connected with the genotype, what's the mechanism in the external world that's actually driving the changes at the genetic level if the two are so loosely connected? I mean, it seems to raise. Well, that gets into some very interesting and complicated stuff. Um, and uh, <laughs> the, more you, the more you look at it, the, the, the more difficult it gets. There are simple things. Like, for example, in the Arctic, all polar bears are white. Um, ptarmigans are white. Uh, Arctic foxes are white. Arctic hares are white. Um, that's not coincidental. It makes sense from a camouflage point of view. It also makes sense from a, um, from a mechanistic point of view because all you have to do to get white animals is to knock out the pigment. But that is, uh, if you want to call it that way, that's devolution. It is the loss of a previously loss of, information. loss of information, and you can lose information pretty easily, as you know people who keep uh, notebooks know <laughs> all too well. <laughs> um, it's a lot harder to gain information and gain useful information, and um, uh, so it is entirely possible that, for example, you could have a barrowman that had genes that did all kinds of things. And in fact, in the ark, the animals that went into the ark were not random animals. They were specifically selected. Uh, 
you know, the, those animals just started walking in apparently on their own. No, they weren't just, the, they weren't just whatever animals happened to be out there. It was, they were specific animals that were being guided into the ark. And that means that they had specific genomes that were probably, one, more advanced than usual, and two, more varied than usual so that once they got out, they could diversify in a new environment where it would be helpful to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, populate multiple in, uh, microenvironments. Um, the dogs that we have, for example, are all bred off of, you know, original uh, stock. Not necessarily, well, necessarily, uh, in our view, an original pair, too, but certainly, uh, um, but what you have is a divergence. And it would be very interesting to see, but I bet you that if you were to look at it, domestic dogs have probably lost things. And they're probably being deliberately bred because they lost things. Uh, whereas, you know, the wild type has the ability still to, to give you those kinds of varieties. Actually, grizzlies are the parent of polar bears. Polar bears have devolved de from grizzlies. According and to and the a matter of fact, theory. polar bears can mate with grizzlies yeah. and produce viable well, offspring. The same family, yeah. Um, you actually brought up what I was going to suggest. If, uh, and I believe it's true, that the flood happened and the boat was as small as it was, what happened since the flood has been a huge amount of evolution. It didn't take millions of years, but the changes that have taken place are phenomenal because you couldn't have had every single kind of cat on the, on the ark, and then there wouldn't have been any room for anything else. So there was cat, which had the possibility of making lions and tigers and kitty cats and bobcats, et cetera, right? I think so. I yeah. think so. Well, the thing to keep in mind is that there are three things that are being covered by the word evolution, and they're not all the same. Number one is what we've called devolution, that is, loss of function, and the polar bear is a classic example. Number two is um, what I would call allele sorting, and that is to say if you have somebody who has the genes for both straight hair and curly hair, then that person can have straight hair descendants and curly hair descendants depending on how the genetics <coughs> sort themselves out in that person's descendants. Mm -hmm. Um, with neither one of them being particularly better or worse than the other one. Uh, that's kind of neutral sorting. But in some, in, in some environments it's nicer to have short hair because they're hot. In some environments it's nicer to have long hair because they're cold, for example. Um, and so you could have, you could have things that that were deliberately designed to be able to produce either kind depending on what the environment is. And that, that can produce extremely fast evolution mm -hmm. by simply breeding. Uh, and then the final thing is evolution as creation of new stuff. New whole structures, feathers that require multiple different proteins in order to create them. That's a whole lot harder to do on an evolutionary basis. And that's really where the, where the, uh, the kind of the line in the sand goes. Uh, yes, go ahead, and then I will point out that it's probably time for us to uh, uh, quit officially after your question. Are you saying then that, uh, and God created up to a point? And God created things that had the ability to further create. <coughs> and he deliberately made this after their kind. Um, but not as if they were identical uh, like we would do in a factory. 
That's what I'm saying. That he intended us to create beings that <coughs> were like ourselves, but not exactly. So when I was a kid and I went to the zoo and I looked at an animal and my dad said, see what God created, uh, that may have not been exactly true. Uh, I think it probably, it's safe to say that it wasn't exactly true. Um, I doubt that uh, God made tigers as ferocious as they are right now, just to give an example. Um, when I read the lion will eat straw like the ox, I suspect that those lions have slightly different genetics than, than the ones that we have roaming around. I doubt that's all environmental influence. So I think there's been some change. Uh, and some of it's not been good. But God created animals and people with the ability to reproduce, but not reproduce precisely exactly. And he actually intended for us to look a little different from each other. Although not necessarily as, as badly as uh, I, I look. I, I doubt he intended for people to be as nearsighted as I am, for example. But evolution can be a very strong argument for special creation because the complexity of the microevolutionary process would seem to be very difficult to actually be produced through some sort of random uh, sequence of events. You know, there's an interesting book out called Evolution for the 21st Century by a guy by the name of James Shapiro that makes the case that animals were designed to evolve. Uh, and he's ca caught heat by it because people say, well, if they were designed to evolve, then somebody had to design them. And that's not allowed. <laughs> and interestingly, he's an atheist. But that's the way he sees it. And, and he, has, he has a lot of data behind him. Go ahead. We'll let uh, you have the last word. Well, Basically, if you look at this issue, I, I'm struck by the fact that uh, there's such a difference in outlook at the data. Uh, when, you look, when you look at a cladogram, for instance, uh, one can say, okay, this represents created types, or one can say, this represents evolution. Now, evolutionists are sometimes uh, candid with this, and they point out very correctly Cladograms do not show any evolution whatsoever. Cladograms show relationships, similarities. So it's an analysis of similarities. And, uh, but the ethos of the evolutionary community is so tuned into evolution, and of course this is normal human behavior, that the they walk into these cladograms and just use them as evolution, uh, as we've seen many times here today uh, in, in these papers here. Um, and that basic assumption is, is, is where, you know, you get such a difference in thinking and interpretation of, of, these, of these things, or like the fossil record, the, the evolutionist fossil record is a history of evolution over billions of years. And, to the creationists, it's a result of a worldwide flood. And we need to keep, to keep this in mind as you, as you look at the, the analysis and cladograms. You can make cladograms out of anything, you know. I, I, I can, you can make cladograms out of houses. Or you can make cladograms out of ladies' hats. Cars. Uh, cars or uh, uh, kitchen utensils. Uh, they do not demonstrate at all evolution basically but they are assumed you have to make the assumption of evolution uh, as they are often used and uh, we need to keep this difference in mind and with that I'll invite you to come next week and uh, we'll have some more data for you to look at react to <laughs>